Andrea Michelle Bowman was a 14-year-old from Hamilton, Michigan. She had been adopted when she was very young and never knew her biological family. On March 11, 1989, Andrea allegedly ran away from her family's farmhouse after getting caught stealing money. She was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. already know, this is a remastered and updated version of an episode I did very early on in Unfound's existence. To be specific, November 16th, 2016. The title of it was A Reunion Undone, and the statement is still true over three years later. In retrospect, though, I think I would call this case No Good Deed, as in No Good Deed Goes Unpunished. Why? Because it's obvious that had Kathy not given her daughter Alexis, also known as Andrea, up for adoption, Alexis would still be here. She wouldn't have disappeared. Kathy did the right thing, that good deed. But making that seemingly right choice led to an unfortunate end. As you will hear, though, despite the circumstances Kathy was in at the time in the 1970s, she does not see it now as the right choice going even to the point of believing adoption is actually harmful to children and not helpful. That will be for you to judge. But if you're wondering why I am remastering and updating this episode now, it's because Dennis Bowman, the adopted father of Andrea Bowman, Kathy's daughter, was charged with the murder of Kathleen Doyle in 1980 on November 22, 2019. The interview will be followed by an updated and new summary. My original summation will not be played. However, you can go back to the original episode to hear it. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Good's website, charlieproject.org. Andrea Bowman, born with the name Alexis, was given up for adoption as a little girl by her mother Kathy after considerable pressure from Kathy's family. Alexis went to Catholic Charities before being taken in by the Bowmans. In 2010, Kathy set about to find her daughter. It was only then that she discovered her daughter Alexis, now named Andrea Bowman, disappeared from Hamilton, Michigan on March 11, 1989, 21 years before. Kathy was then told that Andrea had stolen money from her parents, then run away. She was never seen again. However, it wasn't long before Kathy began to learn about Dennis Bowman, Andrea's adopted father, who had an extensive criminal record before and after the adoption. He is now in custody for the murder of Kathleen Doyle in 1980. Yet questions still remain. Number one, how could the Bowmans be allowed to keep Andrea after Dennis went to jail in the early 1980s? Number two, What evidence have police discovered recently that led them to Dennis regarding the murder of Kathleen Doyle? And number three, will this be the chance Kathy has been wanting for almost 10 years, a chance to find out if Dennis really did kill her daughter? Andrea's biological family has no doubt Dennis Bowman murdered Andrea, although there is still no evidence to that effect. The guest for the episode back in November 2016 was Andrea's biological mother, Kathy Turkanian. You will hear her 2016 interview today. Unfound news. Dad is here. I flew to Pennsylvania on Monday, December 9th, and we drove back December 10th. We went from Renfrew, Pennsylvania to Clearwater Beach, Florida in a total time of 16 hours and 44 minutes total time, not just driving time. Rained half the way, and the other half was beautiful. Dad will be here until at least February, or the length of time that he can stand me. Next, speaking of Dad being here, 
Not sure how much outside work is going to get done while he is here. What I mean by that are the books and other stuff Unfound does. The episodes will get done as long as we don't have some guests who flake on us, like has happened recently. But everything else, probably on the back burner until Dad goes back to Pennsylvania. Having just said that, we at Unfound are looking for a person who can devote time to rebuilding the Unfound website then managing it from then on. This person should have extensive WordPress experience. This job is not for a newbie. Once on board, this person will automatically be slotted into an assistant role like Emily, Cherie, Carrie, Heather, and Eric already are. Contact me at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com with your resume and examples of your work. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on Podomatic, iTunes, Stitcher, Instagram, Twitter, Spotify, and Facebook. On Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, please join us on YouTube for the Unfound live show. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. You can also contribute at PayPal, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. That is also the email address. Merchandise, the books at Amazon.com in both ebook and print form. Do not forget the reviews. Shirts at unfound-podcast.myshopify.com. Cards at makeplaincards.com forward slash sell forward slash unfound podcast. And please mention unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. I'm so happy to have on the show my guest. Kathy Turkanian, biological mother of Andrea Bowman. Kathy, thank you for being on the show. How are you doing today? Uh, thank you for having me. I'm doing well today, Edward. Let's just start back at the beginning. First, tell the, the listeners a little bit about yourself, and then go back to the early 70s, the circumstances that went on with you, and the daughter that you have that you named Alexis. Okay, well, I'll do my best. Um, I was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, my name was uh, Mary Kathleen Ewing. I was adopted at six years old. My name was changed to Catherine Mary Croker. I uh, was my third, it was my mother's third husband, so. Um, and he was in the Navy, so we traveled a lot when I was a child. I think she was, uh, I was in the first grade. So by the time I was in the seventh, we had been, I had been to seven different schools. And needless to say, it sort of rattled a kid going through that much. But so had all my other siblings, and I come from a large family. There's six of us. But um, sadly, we were very dysfunctional, and um, unfortunately, my third my mother's third husband, my stepfather, adopted father, was abusive. And so it just really kind of made our family fall apart. Uh, my mother wasn't mentally really able to handle six kids and a husband that was gone all the time in this service. So anyway, um, my, old, rather my younger sister got ill. And so that sort of took my mother's attention even more away from the rest of her kids. And... Um, I just had some really bad things happen to me as a young teenager, and I was a runaway in 1972. And uh, I ran away to New Orleans, unbelievably, and survived it, uh, which, you know, maybe the times have changed. Maybe those were sweeter times. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but mm -hmm. I got down there, and I was a pretty smart kid. You know, I, a comment made to me I can remember was uh, when they found out how old I was, a friend of mine uh, said I, that they thought I was dumb for 17, but pretty smart for 14. So, wow. You, know, I, you were 14 I, years old in it. you were 14 years old in New Orleans. That's right. Wow. That's right. Okay. And I had hitchhiked from Virginia to New Orleans uh, and had survived it and went to work and got myself, you know, got to know people and started living with this little Mexican girl and we worked for, you know, a man who owned apartments, and it really kind of shaped up to, like, maybe I could even consider going back to high school, which I did for about a week and a half, and it was just such a chaotic mess as mm -hmm. far as just the school itself because it was just segregating in a really nice part of New Orleans. Long story short, I didn't last. And I can remember the math teacher saying to me, you weren't as brave as you thought you were, huh? <laughs> <laughs> So 
anyway, I went back to work. I worked as a waitress. And in the time that, well, let's say in the first two months that I got down to New Orleans, I met, I'll call him a boy now for the age that I am, but mm -hmm. young man that I eventually married and who is Alexis's father, I met him probably about two months after I got down there. And um, so he and I started living together. And about nine months into it, I called my mother because I was missing her. And I just really wanted to go home, you know. It was, I, mm -hmm. uh, I got the, you know, the uh, idea that maybe I needed to go back to high school and uh, home was the only place that I could actually achieve that. And, you know, at that point, my mother was, I know, very, very displeased with me, but, you know, it was a two-way street, and there's a lot of stuff she's died since that I'm not going to go into because it just mm. is irrelevant now. But um, when I called her, she said to me, I don't have a daughter named Kathy, which really floored me because I expected more, at least a little bit more than that from her, but mm. I also kind of understood it. But so I just kind of left it alone, and before I knew it, she was hounding me at work and you know, mm -hmm. I was the age I was, and she was beginning to threaten me. I did call her back, and, you know, she was too much. If I didn't come home, she was going to call the police and my boss and just blow the whistle on me. Now, I was, like I said, I called her. I wanted to go home. But uh, she threw in something that I really wish she hadn't done now. She knew that I was with Randy, and she said, you know, you're going to have to marry that boy. If you want to bring him home, you're going to have to marry him. It was not my intention to bring him home. But anyway, it was not my intention probably to stay there either. I just knew that I couldn't live with her. It had just, you know, mm -hmm. there, were, there were issues, and nobody was ever going to address them. So I went home with him, and sure enough, she railroaded me more or less into marrying him. And um, then I was no longer her child. She was no longer responsible for me. And then I reflect, I think that's pretty much why she did it, you know. She didn't want to have me several states away, and something happened to me, and they call her to come get me, okay? Yeah. So now I'm Randy's responsibility. <laughs> well, actually, I was emancipated. It emancipated me, which was really what I was aiming for with her anyway, because there was just a lot of issues. My mother was the queen of bad decisions, okay? She made a lot of bad decisions in her life, and it unfortunately put an end to her in some ways, but... So I kind of, the writing on the wall for me was to get away from her. That's all I can, my first memories, as, you know, are just get as far away from her as possible because she's going to cause you great damage. Now, that's a terrible thing to say about your mother, but it was always that. And my sister felt the same way. She left home at 15. So, you know, it wasn't just me, and it took me years to figure that out. So anyway, Randy and I got married. We went back to New Orleans, and I guess it was about another year and a half and I got pregnant and he didn't want to have a child and I was kind of like too broke to go all the way from Louisiana to New York City and have an abortion and not only that it just wasn't in my makeup I just didn't want to do it mm -hmm. and I was very naive and you know I had no idea what I was getting myself into in a lot of respects of course you know and I was totally alone my mother was in Virginia I was in Louisiana and that was perfectly fine me. I didn't want her around. I didn't. That's so strange, you know. I, it's, it's the, you know, that I think about this these days. It's like, where was that need? You know how kids yeah. need their mama. Yeah. And I, and it may just stem from her saying, I don't have a daughter named Kathy. I don't know. I just don't know. That's a good possibility. I, she was not there. She was not there with me throughout my pregnancy. So she really knew nothing of me. And it was funny to me in some ways that she never tried to find out how I, how I was doing, you know, and, and what, what did I have, a girl or a boy, nothing, you know, I didn't get mm -hmm. a card, nothing, and I spent quite a bit of time in the hospital with Alexis because I got sick, I was preeclampsic, which is the blood pressure goes up, and um, she was breached, which means she had, I had to have a C-section for her. so I was two weeks, my last two weeks of my pregnancy was in the hospital, on my back, on bed, bed rest because of my blood pressure. So, you know, yeah. that was the worst thing that happened. But you ended up having Alexis, her. but you ended up having her. I ended up having her. I had her and went home with her in New Orleans, and I had an apartment there and was able to get little jobs here and there when I needed to fill in the money when Randy wasn't making enough or however that went, you know, my mm -hmm. rent was cheap. 
But then one night I went to work, one afternoon, and I came home and I uh, found Randy in the living room with some some woman he had picked up in the French Quarter who uh, I think they'd been having an affair for a while, and he was supposed to be taking care of Alexis, and he wasn't. She was in her bed crying, and she was on a, a, a mattress with no sheet, and she didn't have a diaper on, and that was... That was it. That, yeah. that just sent me off. That just sent me off, you know? Mm-hmm. So the next day I got my check. I got a, a, a ticket for the bus, and I went home on a bus. It took me five days on a bus, Greyhound bus, in 1974, to get from Louisiana to Virginia. Wow. When I got there, um, <laughs> and Alexis was a beautiful child throughout the whole thing. The baby didn't cry at all for the last hour that I was on the bus. It was amazing, you know? So when I got there, my mother met me at the bus station, and, uh, you know, she checked Alexis over, and one of the first things she said to me, and this kind of gives you an inside, mm-hmm. a, a sort of a picture of the inside of how it was in my life with my mother. The first thing she said to me was, I was expecting this baby to have diaper rash all over her body. And I'm like, how do you think? Your kids got raised with no type mm-hmm. of rest because us older siblings were taking care of them. Of course, I would never speak to my mother that way, but, you know, that's just the sort of person she was, you know. She handed off all the responsibility for her other children to the older siblings and just went in her room and closed the door. And it's depression, you know. It's things like that. But so Was this what brought that, about with, – was this kind of relationship you had with your mother, this is what – eventually brought about the adoption, giving her up? Well, my mother immediately assumed that I wasn't keeping the, my child. She just mm-hmm. immediately assumed she was either going to take the child, she was either going to take Alexis, or, or I was going to give her away. So behind my back, she went to the uh, Catholic Charities, I, I believe, first, mm-hmm. who, um, you know, basically, my mother was in a, she just had, uh, a, a very bad cancer scare. She had a, a mastectomy and, you know, survived it, but they told her she, you know, made it five years, she might make it ten. So it was always walking that tightrope, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think she just saw this whole thing play out as my future, her future, Alexis's future, and it would be that she would adopt my daughter, although I had never said anything to her about it. It amazes me how this came about. But I'll go on from there. She had gone down to the uh, Catholic Charities and basically told them the predicament that she was in, that I was in, that there was a baby involved. And I find out 20 years later that my mother also said that I had taken LSD throughout my pregnancy and that um, and that Randy had said Alexis, Randy, my husband, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. had said Alexis, ripple wine in her baby bottle. Does that never happen? That is all that untrue. All untrue. Because that's all okay. very untrue. Okay. Now, I know people now. It's and, amazing. And let's just be clear, you didn't find body. you didn't know that at the time. You found that out in two I found that out in twenty years later after okay. I was notified that all of this had happened. Okay. okay. Great. Um okay. And it was used to sort of shut my mouth. It was mm-hmm. It was something that the Bowmans used to try to shut my mouth. Okay, we'll get, to, we'll get we'll get to that. Just go we'll yeah, go yeah, back yeah, to yeah, that. Sure. So Absolutely. this this adoption though ended up happening, or you giving her up, and the adoption ended up happening. I guess you agreed to it or forced into it. Well, I think what happened was I began to really realize that. Well, first of all, first of all, when my mother what my mother did was she came back and she said to me. You can, well, how'd she put it? Either I can ab- adopt Alexis or you can put her up for adoption and she can get the best people out there because she's an infant and, you know, people mm-hmm. who are adopting infants, will, the best of the best out there, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And you can't, oh, oh and, and she said, and if I take her and die in 10 years, you'll come back and ruin her life. You know, and I was just like defiant as I'll get out. You're not getting my kid. Look what happened to me. I'd give her a what, you know. Mm-hmm. She had me in, in a position of, first of all, she pretty much, I had no money, you know. I was totally dependent on her. Randy had completely abandoned us. Mm-hmm. So I was, I think I was stripped down. To, I think I was beginning to sort of revert back into the kid that I was, 
you know. I wanted help, but I didn't want, you know, my mother was very harsh. She had a way of being very... Sounds like I didn't it. want my mother to inflict on my daughter what she inflicted on me. Mm-hmm. I didn't want her to have the life I had, okay? I was more or less promised that if I let her go right away, she would get the best families out there that were looking to adopt, you know? And this was before the day that you could actually pick through this possible best scenario, mm-hmm. okay? And yep. open adoptions came to be, and that's a bunch of, that's a big lie, too. But, you know, so this wonderful, beautiful picture is painted for me if I make this choice, but if I make that choice, I'll ruin her life. Mm-hmm. Now, I was only 17, you know. I think at that point I had really held it together well, and I just needed somebody to help me, you know. And when your mother won't help you, you really have no place to go. And at that point, I didn't understand the welfare system. I And really, truthfully, didn't want her to live that way. You know, mm-hmm. I had lived that way. My first memories were hunger, homelessness, fear. I didn't want that, you know. Mm-hmm. So I opted that direction. And, you know, I really don't, I don't hold it against myself. I probably did for the first 10 years, but I got over that because, mm-hmm. I was pretty much brainwashed now that I think about it from this end of it all. But you did, gi- but you did give me. Alex, you gave Alexis up for adoption, and you carried on I with did. your life. More or less, I, you know, didn't carry on like I would have normally if this had never happened. Okay? Yeah, right. I right. spent many years on the verge of suicide, mm-hmm. and you know, I know that now. But it took all of this mm-hmm. rushing back at me to realize it. But yeah, for several years, I was probably very. Self-destructive, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and probably very suicidal. But I'm not that. That's not how I operate, you know. And mm-hmm. I mean suicidal in the way of like having real urges to do things. Like, and I don't know if that comes with your age. You know, do twenty-year-olds get these kind of uncontrollable urges? All of us, or them, <laughs> or whatever. But you know, twenty-year-olds, I think, tend to do crazier things than forty-year-olds. I think, yeah. That's well, you probably, know, yeah. for instance. I used to have the urge of jumping out of a car. Mm. And I don't know where it came from. And now that is self-destructive. And I can yeah. remember being depressed a lot, you know. But that was a very strong urge. It was like it was everything I could do to stay in the car. So I think I... But you did get yourself sorted out. out. I mean, you eventually... Obviously, you're out. still here. and. But here's why. Here's mm-hmm. why. Mm-hmm. I wanted to meet my daughter. They promised me I would meet my daughter when she was 18. You do this, you just let her go, let mm. her be raised by good people, pro, you know, and at 18 you can save her, and you can, you can reconnect. And that's but, when know, 2002 came around. Well, actually, she was, when I started, when the Internet started becoming available mm-hmm. to me and that sort of thing, I immediately started putting her name out there and the story and trying to find her, you know. But the thing is, is you... She's not going to be able to find herself unless she knows who she is as a, you know, who she was before she was adopted. Mm-hmm. So really all of that is just kind of just didn't work, okay? So in 2010, after having talked to the uh, Catholic uh, charities and found out that they had flipped her over to uh, Norfolk Human Services, um, which I have a much better name for them, but I won't mm-hmm. go into that, um, but they had flipped her over to that agency, and that agency had adopted her. And so out, so they had all the paperwork. They had everything mm-hmm. to do with who got her, da 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 da. Okay, but they only take it as far as end of the adoption. The, like I went to court, and they gave me six months to get her back. And I tried, and I couldn't get anybody to help me then. So when I gave up, they got her. In mm-hmm. other words, I didn't show up at the end of that six months with everything Mm -hmm. laid out to be able to please the court to get my daughter back, you see? Mm -hmm. Once she went into into foster care, she became a ward of the state. Now, I've got to prove I can take care of her, even though I never This is back in the 1970s. Right. Now, uh, you know, mind you, nobody came to my house and took my daughter because I did something wrong to her. No, I know. We know, yeah. That that never happened. I know. So, But now I'm in the position, because I let her go to foster care... That I, that I might as well have been a drug addict, shooting dope on the yeah. corner, 
waiting yeah. for my, you know, I yeah. might as well have been that because that's the position I was going to be judged from. Not that I was a just totally freaked mm. out teenager who needed some help. Mm -hmm. You know, she was five months old when I showed up at my mother's house. Yeah. She was in perfect health. You know, well, so anyway, I couldn't, I couldn't pull it together. So I just let her go. But I always, always kept in my head up at 18, you know, I'm mm -hmm. going to find her. Well, I decided at 15, I wanted to, that when she was 15, I wanted to find her. But, you know, all I could do was call the agency and say, hey, you know, how yeah, do you, that's... what do I have to do? What is, you know, how do I line this up? So I just finally said, look, folks. Here's my phone number. Here's my address. Here's my name. If that kid walks into that office, you tell her to get in touch with me. Now, evidently, they took me serious and put it in the file. And I think I said that to them in, like, 2005. Mm -hmm. Because in 2010, I got that letter. And that mm -hmm. letter came from the Norfolk, Virginia uh, Human Services Department. Department of Human Services. And um, it said... You need to call us. There's some real important information we need to, to tell you, you know. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I'm going to meet her. She's agreed to, you know, there's going to be a reunion. And it might not be the best thing in the world, but at least I'll get to know that she's okay. And she'll get to know her story. So I called him up, and uh, <laughs> first thing the woman said to me was, are you alone? And I was, you know. Mm -hmm. I was down in Florida, and my husband was up in Massachusetts. I had my brother and my and his friends and my friends that I could lean on. But, you know, I was alone. I was alone in the apartment, alone in the state, in that sense. So he said it to me a couple times, and I said, well, do you mean, like, should I be sitting down? He said, yeah. He says to me that uh, a, a detective had shown up, and I, I don't believe she gave me the state that the detective came from, and that the detective needed DNA from me in order to identify a Jane Doe in Wisconsin and also to put into CODIS in case Alexis's body was ever found. And that Alexis had gone missing in 1989 and that the detective believed that the adoptive father was the reason. That's and you found out this 21 years... No, it was 20 no, Oh, 19... Oh, well, okay. 20 years. 74 to 84... And it was, it was 20 years. I don't know how I figured it out, but it was mm -hmm. 20 years. Mm -hmm. Oh, so she went missing in 89. And yeah, I you found it. I think it was right before the, her 20, that 25th year hit. Okay. And it was right before. But anyway, so my husband, I lost it. You know, I, I bet. just lost it. What do you mean this adopted father murdered her? And what do you mean she's been missing for him? What do you mean you need my DNA? You know? Mm -hmm. It's like. Who wrote this script, and why are you giving me this lead? You know, why are you giving me this to read? Yeah. So I just kind of flipped out. I just kind of lost it and just couldn't focus on I couldn't do it. I couldn't go looking for her as a missing person through every state to see if I could recognize her face or what it was he matched up the birth date. Right. Your, your, your husband did. He did his own search on the Internet, and he found That's out. Right. He figured it That's out. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And, you know, when I saw her, I was like, that's not my daughter. But, you know, I'm a blonde. She's just this dark-haired child, you know. And that was it. That was the only thing that, you know, really kind of like looking at me with dark hair. Yeah. You know, and her mouth's a little different. And uh, it's strange. How, you know, I think some of it came from I just didn't want to accept the fact she was on a missing persons list. The first one on the list. And in fact, she ended up being, she was on a music video that you had seen right. by Runaway Train, and you had watched that I video, did. and you saw her in her, and you didn't even know it was her at the, t right. at the time. That's, that's, right. that's amazing. And I was what? in New Orleans when I saw it, and I was, it was just, I'd just gotten up, and I was drinking coffee, and I just, I wasn't watching the video when it first started, I just remember... Mm -hmm hearing the song and something about it, you know, like I said, I've been a runaway, you know, yeah. and it's, it's just a really sad story when kids run away. They don't run away from good homes. Right. Kids don't run away from good homes. And I think society needs to get a grip on that, you know. Mm -hmm. I think, I think you know, we beat up these little runaways and we don't stop and think, well, where are they coming from and where are we sending them back to? 
So what'd you do? What'd you do after that day? You found out. I blew it off. I went like, my kid didn't end up like that. She didn't run away from me because I treated her like my mother treated me, you know? Mm -hmm. I just sort of like moved on with my life. What'd you do in 2010, though? What'd you do? In 2010, I, you know, I had myself, I had myself thinking, this is not going to, this is not going to affect me like I raised her, right? Yeah. It's not going to affect me like if I had raised this child in my house for 18 years, 14 years, and she vanished. I'm going to have a little more distance. That's not so. Yeah. That's just not so. You do not forget your kid. Yeah. I, you know, she was five months old when I let her be adopted. That's what I remember. That's, that's, that's who I remember. I yeah. don't know this 14-year-old. Okay? Yeah. Yep. So you, you killed my infant. As far as I'm concerned, you know, because I can, I can't name them because they would get mad at me if I did. But there's a whole. Well, they probably wouldn't get mad at me. They'd just probably deny it. I don't know. Mm. But yeah. Eight, up to eight detectives told me this. I, I didn't just assume this on my own. Now, after they told me this, I went and FOIA'd all his information. And would you say FOIA? You got we got to we got to spell that out for people. FOIA means okay. Freedom of in- Information Act for the listeners. That's right. Yes. That's okay. Right. And every state, you can access a person's criminal record via the FOIA. You just write out, I want so-and-so's record. Please send me the uh, form if they need a form. You fill out the form. They tell you, you know, if there's going to be money, what you've mm. got to pay. And then you just get all of, you know, what they went to court for, what the conviction was. Well, his very first crime was... Well, let's, uh, we have to say, we can't use a pronoun here. We've got to say his name, Dennis Bowman. Yes, is the Dennis guy's Lee name. Bowman from Hamilton, Michigan. Yes. Born in Muskegon. Yes. His very first crime was in 1981. He, now, Alexis was six years old. He, had, one of, he or Brenda had dropped her off at her first day at school. I think she was in preschool at, the point, at that point, maybe kindergarten, so it wasn't mm-hmm. quite first grade. But So she was in school while he is out basically stalking the backwoods of Holland uh, looking for somebody to jump, looking for a teenage girl to force into the woods and rape. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what he tried to do. He basically pinned this girl, pulled a gun out, told her, get in the woods. She just stood there in fright. It's all in the transcript. Mm-hmm. She stood there with her mouth hanging open going, what do you mean get in the woods? He shoots at her. It goes past her ear. He shoots at her again. It, go- it hits her right, or rather it hits the ground right in front of her. And he tells her, I will blow a hole in you if you don't get in the wood. Now, he admitted to all this. All this is in the transcript. And this is Alexis. Uh, Alexis is the people that Catholic Charities ended up giving Alexis to, Dennis and Brenda Bowman. Right. Well, right. they actually handed the case over mm. to um, to uh, Norfolk Human Resources, mm-hmm. and they're the ones who okay. located the Bowmans. The Bowmans. Let me just let me do a side note to this. In 1974, there was a law written. It's called the CAPTA law, and it was written by Vice President Mondell, and it spoke specifically to giving federal funds to agencies and to people who adopted disabled children. Yeah. Well, my mother's little story about my daughter, right. and I know this through Brenda because she tried to like she tried to use it against me that that Alexis was labeled with fetal alcohol syndrome. Now that that diagnosis, I was an RN, and I know this mm. for a fact because I was around back then, too. Fetal al- alcohol syndrome, that condition had just been, had just come to be the yeah. year before. Like 1973 had just, you know, the, the syndrome had just been uh, identified, diagnosed, and labeled, okay? I never drank. I never drank until after I gave Alexis up, and it was quite a few years before I ever drank, mm-hmm. okay? Yeah. So, this child did not, and you can look at her, anybody with any sense would know there's nothing wrong with her. She went from straight A's while Dennis was in prison to D's and F's when he got out, okay? But in, in the 1980s. Yeah. But Ma- Mondale had the, we had this law that said the people who adopted or took into their care children with certain problems, no, fetal alcohol, would be, get government money. It didn't have to just be one thing. It right, right. Right. So disabil- alcohol syndrome was a brand new diagnosis. My point being, diagnoses are a dime a dozen, number one. Okay? Mm-hmm. You can throw diagnoses at people all day long, and another doctor will say, they don't have any of that. 
Yeah. Okay, but they saw, I believe, this is my belief, and if I can get into those records, and I will, it's just a matter of time, mm. that what they did is they decided, okay, she's fetal alcohol syndrome, it's such a new syndrome, they won't figure it out for years and years in the first place, we'll get funded for her getting adopted, the parents get a certain amount of money every month, I believe, and I'll bet you any money money they did until mm-hmm. she got into school, and they re-diagnosed her and said, nothing wrong with this kid? So... That Mondale, but anyway, that bill once written passed, Mondale almost immediately came out and said, you know, this really is probably going to cause a lot of children to get abused, the system to get abused, these children to go into situations mm-hmm. that just because of the money they access these kids. Okay? And that's kind of what happened, and that's, and that's, and that's what happened in Alexis' case. And that's what happened. She's one of the first ones. I'll guarantee you, she's one of the first ones. And this is, if I could get into these files, I bet I could find a class action suit going on somewhere. See, Catholic Charities just got out of the adoption. Yeah, they don't do adoptions right anymore. Right after I found out about Alexis. And I'm yeah. not kidding you, right afterwards. Something tells me they got funded quite a bit of money from the state to flip those kids over there so the state could have, make money on the capture bill and so could they. Just, I get this gut feeling, you know? Let's get back to Dennis so, Bowman. So in 1980... He tried to uh, – 1980 – Let me get back to who they were prior to adopting Alexis. Okay. This is real important. I found out that through the detective, because I talked to the detective, after we located where Alexis went missing from, we contacted that detective. That detective let me know that this case was botched by the original investigators that Alexis told that Bowman was – uh, Dennis Bowman was molesting her, that the social workers had botched it. It had just been botched all the way down the line. Now, they, he told me that, and he told my husband that. Mm-hmm. He said that the uh, investigation was never, that there was never any investigation into Dennis Bowman's past. Dennis Bowman was on parole at the time for the 1980 crime of pulling that gun on that teenager and telling her to get in the woods, or he was going to kill her. Mm-hmm. So to get back to that story... When she, what happened was after he shot her the second time and he said he was going to kill her if she didn't go into the woods, a truck comes pulling up behind him. He doesn't see the truck until it's right at his side, but she sees it coming and she takes her. Now, I talked to this woman 24 years after this happened to her. But anyway, she took her bicycle and she threw it out in the middle of the road mm-hmm. in front of the truck, okay? And the judge said... One of his statements in the court transcripts about this was if it were not for the fortuitous passing of that truck and that woman's willingness to do whatever she had to do to get out of the situation, he would have killed her. He would have raped and killed her. And that if he's out and he's in the public, women are not safe. Now, that was written by a judge right before he went to jail for that 1980 crime. Alexis vanished two and a half years later after he got out. Okay, Mm -hmm. almost as soon as he got out, he started molesting her. Mm -hmm. And then she vanished. So it sort of fulfilled what the judge said. So I spoke to his first victim, and what she told me was the look, his eyes, she'd never seen such evil in her life. Mm -hmm. And now she was 18 years old, you know, so, you know, she probably hadn't encountered a lot of evil, but that stuck with her. Those eyes stuck with her. She said she'd rather been shot in the back than forced into the woods with him. Mm -hmm. And she thought she'd put him away forever. No. He didn't even spend five years in prison. Oh, he spent just five years. And Brenda Bowman, after he was uh, transferred up to uh, Ken Ross from Jackson, because Jackson had a, a riot in, like, 1982, I think. And so somehow Bowman ends up with all of his records on his lap, so he can plead for a mistrial, and they just laugh in his face and send him up to Ken Ross. Well, so in Ken Ross, what, uh, what Brenda does is she loads Alexis up, takes her out of school, and follows him up there. So she can be right to northern Miami, Michigan, right northern door. Michigan, up, right. the, up there, That's yeah. Right. From the, all the family and friends Alexis knew, Brenda follows that rapist, sociopathic, narcissistic maniac. Yeah. So she can be right next to that prison. I went up there. I drove the whole – I went everywhere Alexis went. Everywhere Alexis has been. I you went up there between – since 2010, That's you've right. been up there. Yes. That's right. Me and a mm-hmm. friend of ours, a mm-hmm. friend of mine that actually got this whole ball rolling mm-hmm. because he's the one – He's the one that found Racine Jane Doe and thought it was Alexis. That, that's how it all happened. 
Yeah. You know, he called the Wisconsin Police Department that called the Michigan Police Department that then, you know, researched a little bit about Alexis's having gone missing and went, Woo, boy, look at this. Whoa, this is yeah. a botched case. And now get this. The guy who found me put Bowman away in 80, was one mm. of the cops on that, or, you know, was part of getting him, him put away. You know, he was one of the investigators mm -hmm. that put it all together to, you know, present it to the court. So he knew Bowman. And, Yes, and, and but me. the thing is, he gets out of jail though, and he and his wife have another daughter. That's right. And w in 1987. Here. That's right. He gets out in '86. Now he was supposed to spend 10 years, which would have been 1990. He should have gotten out. But he gets out in '86, and she's pregnant within the year. Well, her daughter is born. She's pregnant within months. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he's he sent back down to Holland, Michigan, to wrap it all up and get you know where the like the pro officer, you know, is all set up and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, she waits up in uh, Kenros, up in the UP, and Alexis is in school. What he did is he moved right back into the trailer that her, um, that his in-laws, Brenda's mother and uh, uh, stepfather, own. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was the trailer that he was living in when he went after that girl in 1980. So wow. he's right back in that neighborhood. Wow. And the amazing thing is, Within a year, some girl was stabbed to death right around the corner from his house. So anyway. Was that killer that ever caught? There. Killer ever caught? No, never was. Never was. Wow. Never was. There, was, there was a girl killed right before he went to prison, right around the corner from his house, knifed to death. And when he gets out, there's a woman that's murdered right around the corner from his house that's knifed to death. And there's a 10-year span between the two. Oh, my. Go so figure, huh? That's certainly a coincidence. So, you know. Yeah, it, it, it had the cops sit up and take notice, too. But they don't have anything. They don't have any DNA. They don't have this. They don't have that. Oh, there's another story. There was a six-year-old that came to the page that I have for Alexis who said, I believe my abduction is tied in somehow to your daughter's having gone missing. And sure enough, Dennis Bowman drove that road that that child was abducted off of back and forth to work every day. You know? Mm -hmm. every, and this happened right after Alexis went missing. This in 1989. Yes, she was abducted, taken from where Dennis Bowman worked, the road he worked off of, and taken all the way to the park that's right around the corner from his house. Now, why did he drive 17 miles? Because that's where he feels safe. So, mm. you know, that whole thing. So what happened right before, right before Andrea uh, disappeared? You know, you, know, you know what the story is. You know, they claim that she took some money and took off. And that's still that's what right. they claim to this day. In November of 88, Alexis started refusing to go home. And From school. They called the police on her, yes. They called the police on her, and they said this kid refuses to come home. Then Alexis told them, he's molesting me. Then they went to Bowman and Brenda's house while they had Alexis, and they said, she's saying this about you. And they said, oh, we didn't do that. She's having problems because she's adopted and whatever else they said, and the social worker said, do whatever you have to do. Now, this is in the record. Mm -hmm. Do whatever you have to do to keep me from coming back out here. Now, this was after he had moved her out to that old farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. out of the trailer where his in-laws owned so other people could see him and know what was going on. He and Brenda moved out to the countryside, and that's where she went missing from. Well, anyway, when she told them that he was molesting her, they went, the truant officer and the social worker went over to the house. They chose not to believe Alexis. The social worker said, do whatever you have to to keep me from coming back here. Alexis went missing, uh, let's see, November, December, January, January, March. About three and a half months later, Alexis vanished. So he did whatever he, he had did. to. He did, yeah. That's, that's the way I read it. Now, did the, I, I, did I the school know. know of his prior conviction from the 1980 incident? Nobody did. Nobody did. Nobody mm. did. Mm. His parole officer allowed him to live in a house with a teenager, a girl who's becoming a teenager. Like she was, yeah, I think 14. When he got out, she would have just been started, or she would have just been 13 when he got out of prison. 74. 16. No, she's 12, just becoming 13. So she moved back down to the Hamilton area after she got out of school in, let's see, kids get out in June. She moved back down there in June of 87. Because he got out in 86 mm -hmm. and she was going to school. 
she was back down there at the very earliest, the, uh, the, the winter of 86, and at the very latest uh, when kids, in, or, yeah. or the, the summer of 87, somewhere in there, yeah. okay? By March of 89, she vanished. And he, she's gone to authorities and said, he's molesting me. And she vanishes mm-hmm. shortly afterwards. And why does she vanish? Because he's on parole for mm-hmm. that 1981 crime. And he knows that if they listen to her, he's going back to prison. For a long, not just five years this time. It's going to be, That's hopefully, right. f- forever. Hopefully. That's right. Right. That's right. And right. now, why did that parole officer allow that man to live in a house with that child? I don't know. Maybe he hit her out. Maybe that's the reason she didn't come back down there for a year. You know? Mm-hmm. Maybe he denied she ever existed. I don't know. I tried to find prison record and parole records on him. They don't exist. You know, mm-hmm. what I think happened is a certain amount of time, the family can, or, or, you know, the person, the convicted person can go and request that the records be destroyed. And mm-hmm. I think that's, that's what, what happened. happened. They systematically, you know, and one thing that's, that's come up over and over again in my search for Alexis is people who, now Hamilton's only about 5,000 people. It's a very small town. Kids have come who are now grown-ups in their 40s have come to me and said, hey, I never knew she went missing. I never, you know, oh we never heard anything about it. Nobody said a word. When I went up there and met the few people whose kids knew my daughter, they said, well, we just thought she ran off. She got fed up, ran off. Is that the way you treat your kids in such a small community? Is that how you handle, you just let them run off? You yeah, it's not like she was home? 19. You know That's what I mean? Right. You know, and she was a child. child. Yeah, yeah, right. We had already gone and said, please help me from this man. Now, Dennis, Alexis, I think, started doing, well, the boys liked her. She was a cute little girl, and it's that time of your life, right? So she had a couple of little boyfriends that she liked, they liked her. But then they went and, and met Dennis Bowman. One particular that I know this from from an inside, Dennis Bowman had a has a knife fixation, and he would pull out his knife, his big sharp knives, and he would show this kid, "Look at how sharp my knife is," and he would shave the hair off his arm. Mm-hmm. Now, just recently, when he repinned the story about what happened in the on that day that he called Alexis a runaway and a thief. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, now thirty years ago, there were no there were no details such as how many piles. Or no, there was a one pile of money. Now there's two. Um, yeah, his story no, has changed over the years as to what yeah, actually happened yeah. that day. He's repinned his story. Now yeah. there's more money, and see, a liar will always add to the lie. You, yeah. you know, people who tell the truth don't have to add or subtract anything. Yeah. That's what they saw. That's what they're going to tell you. People who tell lies don't remember the details. So they they don't just usually they don't subtract from the lie they add to the lie and sure enough that's what Dennis did now there's more to what happened to Alexis and added to not you know there's not just one pile of money she took she took one pile of money but left a pile of money like who does that right she hated him so much that she's gonna run off and steal his money she would take it all are there any allegations what about his other daughter are there any allegations that he might have done things to his his newer well, daughter that was I born in eighty. Yeah, go ahead. I, I want to add this in, in that story, and then I'll answer you this. Mm-hmm. He also added in his story that he just penned last year. All of a sudden, there's ripped jeans and a knife in this story. Where do these ripped jeans and a knife come from? They come from. He's fascinated with knives. And he's so fascinated, he's lost sort of track what he said. So he might as well throw a knife in there. And oh, some ripped jeans. What the heck? See what I'm saying? He's the only person I know whose memory gets better as he gets older. Huh. But, you know? l- but let's go to 1998. Now, what happened with him in 1998 with a co-worker? In 98, he was working. I want to say he was working like part-time, but I don't know if sure. <coughs> Excuse me. But he was working in like an assembly kind of industry mm-hmm. and building yachts. And so his co-worker, this woman... I'll call her BB. She uh, was uh, actually scratch that, but um, so I don't want to name her. But anyway, she worked with him, and she, uh, you know, was totally oblivious of him. She's like a twenty-some odd year old girl working part time, and he's a forty-some year old man working part time, and they never crossed paths except for now and then. But he had worked up an entire scenario of a relationship 
an affair with her. And that's what the psychiatrist said, that his fixation was, with her was not unlike a full-blown affair, mm-hmm. okay? This girl didn't even know he was alive. He was infatuated with her, said. yeah. Infatu- yes, yes. yes. Now, but, you know, hey, people have crushes, you know? Sure. And sometimes you fall over your... You know, you fall on your face trying to, like, express it and, hey, hey, notice me over here, you know. Not this deviant. In Dennis's mind, he's having a full-blown affair. She's seeing other men, so therefore she must pay. Yeah. So he starts breaking into her place. And she lives in this rather isolated, uh, you know, this is like the backwoods of Michigan. And he finds out where she lives. He knows her name, where she lives. She doesn't even know he's alive. And he starts breaking into her place. Well, she did have a boyfriend that she was breaking up with, and he was in and out, but I don't think he was breaking in, okay? I don't really remember the details of him, but there were a dozen times that an unknown person broke in and one time that he broke in. So, you know, it was like, it was so weird that the cops put an alarm on the trailer. They said, look, you know, we just got to figure this out. This girl's gone most of the time. These break-ins are happening at, you know, all hours. It's something really strange is going on. Some weirdos out there. And sure enough, okay, he breaks into the place because he doesn't know the alarm has been put on. The cop goes over there, and the cop catches him jumping out of the trailer, okay? There's crowbars everywhere, mm-hmm. crow marks, crow, you know, those, mm-hmm. those pry marks on the doors where, you know, he's pried his way in and out. He talked himself somehow. Well, again, sociopaths can be charming, okay? They just get that counter, that alter ego that's charming and bring that one up okay so he charms himself outrageous I, you know he gets out so just to him? boil it down he gets out of it at least for the time being he gets out right. of it for the time being for a few hours he gets released to go home okay mm-hmm. so the cop is driving back now he told this cop the reason he was over at this woman's house and that they were such great buddies he was having electrical work done on his house and he had diarrhea so he had to go over to her house to use her bathroom now you know what nobody gets in my house that i know that's got problems like that okay mm-hmm. they're gonna go to their family's house he gets away with it but later they go back to his house and he is charged right. with something and he is interviewed by psychiatrist. What does he say to the well, psychiatrist? Actually, apparently, he said a lot. Um, I only have the last page, and it's page 58. And in the last page, every time the psychiatrist, now this is just sort of a summation of what the psychiatrist said, but the psychiatrist said every time I questioned Mr. Bowman about his missing daughter, Andrea Bowman, he says back to me, all the evidence is lost. He says that coupled with, and I would read it to you if I had it in front of me, but mm-hmm. that coupled with the age that Andrea Bowman vanished, along with the fact that Dennis Bowman's problems, problems started at the same age. In other words, he started having, well, his a sociopath basically mm-hmm. becomes a sociopath because they feel everybody's against them. A sociopath that becomes pathological and ends up killing people is because that sexual thing hits that, that it, but they both occur at the same time, okay? Mm-hmm. So that, that, that anger is, the sex and the anger become one, okay? Yeah. So that they're angry forever, but, but now it's all confused with sexuality, and so that every grown woman, every little, every girl is that 15-year-old girl that ticked him off. Mm-hmm. When that when his puberty was happening at the same time, so basically what the psychi- the psychiatrist said was those two things together makes him point his finger right at Dennis Bowman for doing for that. for Andrea's disappearance for her disappearance. He needs to be the one looked at for her dis- disappearance. Tell now, the listeners was- tell the listeners about what happened when his daughter, who eventually got old enough of college age. What happened when she ended up going to college and Dennis Bowman? What what happened with that? Well, I had gotten through an inside source more information about Dennis Bowman. And his daughter went to school, uh, in a, I would say about ni- uh, 2008, I want to say. She, she studied. Mm-hmm. She didn't graduate. She studied okay. there. Okay. So she went to this college, and for some reason he was making enough of a – of a, he was seen enough on that campus that over and over again, the campus police stopped him and said, what are you doing on this campus? And told him to leave. He was asked to leave. Now, this was more than once. 
you mm-hmm. know, less than a dozen times. Now, this girl didn't go there for four years. She just went there for, I think, probably a semester or two. So more or less, he was there every day of every week that she was in class, just hanging out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, very what strange. Father that? Very what strange. father goes and hangs out? He might have even been in the dormitory because one of the girls, sadly, her only friend and the only person that's come forward and said, now, this man didn't do this. I asked her, how many times did you see him on that campus? Because I had this information. She said, once. I said, where did you see him? In the do- in his daughter's dorm room. What's he doing hanging out? In his and how far was room? that from where he lived? Uh, Kalamazoo is where the school is, and mm-hmm. he lives in Hamilton. So that's probably like 40 miles. Wow. Okay. So he's making an 80-mile round trip, it's, let's say, three times a week. And he's hanging out in the dorm room so many times that the police asked him to leave over and over again, and it's documented. So mm. he's stalking those young girls. And mm-hmm. it really would be great if I could get them to believe that this is a fact, but there's a few of them that just insist on putting themselves in the line of fire. So mm. there's nothing I can do about it. Because his daughter thinks he can do no wrong. Of course. Yeah. She's pretty much, I think, she's pretty much inherited that sociopathic mentality from him. I think it's a an inherent an inherent thing. Okay? And then nurture, nature, that whole thing plays out. And his and and the wife is do you, let's put it this way, what you think you know about it, do you think that she had a part in Andrea's disappearance as well? The wife? I believe she realized pretty quickly that Dennis did this. And I believe no, I know that all the tips she put out in the six months before they vanished after Alexis went missing. They moved out of the house she went missing from and literally dropped off the map six months after that happened, after she went missing. But in that six-month period, Brenda Bowman called the police over and over again saying that she had been notified that Alexis had been seen XYZ place. Well, my first question Mm -hmm. is, why didn't they just call the police? Why -hmm. would they be calling her to have her tell, you know what I mean? Yeah. Basically, it's an elaborate ruse, in my yeah. eyes. Yeah. It's an elaborate ruse to uh, lead that truant officer all over South West Michigan to wherever. See, Dennis Bowman, like I said, has that magical thinking, and his last statement to the police was, they asked him, what do you think happened to Andrea? He said, oh, she's probably, she probably ran off. No, she ran off with the Mexicans, and she's dead. Okay? Mm-hmm. So his magical thinking has put it all off on all the Mexicans, and she's dead. The only truthful statement there is that she's dead. Yeah. Now, he feels so confident that all the evidence is lost that he can go into the police department, lie on his second story, and when they ask him what does he think happened to her, he can say she's dead. Where do, you, th- where do, you, think, where do you think your Alexis is? Speaking of evidence... She is. That's what I you had believe. The property that she went missing from. I had all that property searched. The, ser- the search went across the road, under the overpass, down into the gullies that could be gotten to. The woman said nothing could be found. That I placed this together in the timeline I put together. She's on the property that he bought. Well, she- he bought uh, property not far from where she went missing, either the year before she went missing or the year she went missing. And his plans were, well, he moved her out of the trailer, out to that country farm, old country farmhouse, killed her, and then took her over to the property that he was buying that mm. had no, it had no mm. structure on it. He, now, he claimed it as his address, but it had no taxable, livable structure on it until 1996. I believe he buried her on that property while light poles were being put in and sewer tanks mm. were being put in. And, you know, I've even mm. talked to the police, and they have... Uh, they have uh, shots of that property over the years. You know, they do like that county, you know, they survey the, the county every so many years. And I've been told they have shots of his property and how it's changed over the years that he's owned it. Now, I Googled his property, and I noticed there's an excavated spot right off his back porch that suddenly after he found out about me got excavate, excavated again, got, like it, it got dug up again. And you can see it on Google Maps. Wow. So Google Earth know. like from the sky like a satellite shot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's on a three proper he's on a three acre property now. 
and it would have taken him no problem at all to kill her, take her to that property, put her in a hole where the septic tank was being yeah. going to be built or going to be buried, and that's where she's at. Now, is that where he lives now? That's where he lives now. That's right. That's where he's at now. Now, since I was located, and this is all you know, surface. Mm-hmm. The police have gone to him and said, you know, Dennis, you know, you need to clear yourself here. You're the person who saw her last. You're the, you know, you have this background. He refuses to cooperate now, and he has had his phone disconnected, and he's thrown up a fence around his property. See, in Michigan, they have a mushroom hunting season, and people can just roam up on your property and go mushroom hunting. Prior to my coming on the scene and mm-hmm. basically just slamming my hands down on the desk. For the last six years. Top of my lungs. Yeah. For the last six years, he's put up a fence so nobody can roam on his property now. But that police officer went over there and put his foot in the door and said, Dennis, clear yourself. And Dennis told him, no uncertain cuss words to get off his property. He wasn't going to cooperate. Mm. Well, there's ways of making a witness talk. And he's put himself in the position of a witness. What's now, Dennis Boone Moman doing now? Where is he? Well, What's he doing now? Does he work? Is he retired? What's he do? He is. As far as I can gather, he's disabled and he draws a disability. I think um, that there's some sort of behind. I think it's involving being a sex offender. Okay. Mm. I think that what happened. Well, he was grandfathered in. See, he's not on a sex offender's list. He was grandfathered in. He did his his dirt before mm. they could. Before there was a law, okay? Yeah. So he's grandfathered in. But I think what happened in 98, they said, okay, bud, you want to stay out of prison? You're going to go to the sex offender school, and you're going to take these drugs right here that's going to keep you corralled, okay? I think that's what's going on. And so now he's on these drugs, and he's claimed he's disabled, and he's claiming disability, basically. I mean, I, I, I can only, you know, I can only sort of like assume from what evidence I have. But I mm. can't imagine that that sex offender program just cut him loose and said okay you're all cured bye-bye uh-uh. so what, what's the, what has to happen next where where is what's what's the next big uh marker mal marker in this what's the next step you're well, trying to uh, what's what's next for you in trying to find your daughter alexis what's next um well i it actually just remains the same i continue to go to the missing in michigan i continue to have that page on Facebook, find Andrea M. Bowman. Mm-hmm. I um, continue to assert that he did what, I'm not the only one who believes he, he murdered her. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I have gotten some insight into the judicial, judicial system that will allow me to sidestep a grand jury. And that's as far as I can really talk about okay. that. How do and, you, you know, if we could just maybe, ra- you know, wrap this up now. What are your attitudes now toward adoption? You know, uh, you were adopted. I've been adopted. We've talked about that, not on this show, but we've talked about my how I was adopted. And then you, you know, kind of being forced to give up Alexis for adoption. How do you feel about that now? You know, having a life of it. I'm just totally appalled. I'm totally appalled that you could actually put a price on a child's head and sell it to the highest bidder, okay? Mm. That's what's happening in adoption today. Now it's big business. A white child, a, a white infant, $30,000. A black infant, $15,000. An Asian infant, $10,000. Who, who decides these prices? Oh, no, I'm sorry, <clears throat> 60000 for a white, 30000 for a, an African American, mm. you know? Mm. So it's baby selling. It's baby selling. Everybody's making a dime. Now, in that, <clears throat> some children get the perfect scenario, and God bless them, they deserve it, because they're never going to see who, most of the time, they're never going to know anything about their birth family, and a lot of it has to do with they're afraid to make their adoptive family angry. You know, it may be that they're perfectly okay with the adoption and everything's hunky-dory, but they're afraid that their adoptive mother and father will disown them, okay? Mm -hmm. So who has the right to do that to a kid? To completely annihilate who they were born to be, and then to hold over their heads a threat of "we will just disown you, and you will have no one." Okay, because the courts took your mother and father, and if you find that you can't connect with them, we've given, we've written you off. Or the fact that they can flat out lie to these young mothers. 
first of all, I was afraid. They worked on my fear, okay? Mm -hmm. They didn't try to prop up what was strong about me. They took everything that was weak about me, my age, my, you know, anybody's afraid of the world when they're that age. I don't care what mask they're putting on, you know? I knew, pretty much I knew what a broken family was, and I didn't want my daughter to have that. But I didn't want to give her up either. Was that my only option? No. But they mm -hmm. wanted me to believe that was my only option. And that's what they do to young women still, okay? And then they go, okay, well, we'll just let you pick out that adoptive family, and we'll do it all open, and everybody will be hunky-dory. And then that family can just go, nope, no more. Turn off that open adoption to close. And guess what? There is no they, – they can't be taken to court. There's no legal – there's no law that says that they have to remain open. So mm -hmm. it's up to them when they want to just switch it all off. Now, mind you, the mother has bonded to the child. The child has bonded to the mother. The adoptive family, or so, you know, so everybody's doing this together, and it's all about love. Until the adoptive family just gets a little twitch, you know? And then they can, they can flip that biological mother into a drug, drug addict in the ditches, you know? I know that's what the Bowmans did to Alexis. They told her that she was adopted right before she went missing. Mm -hmm. So he basically systematically worked it, worked his way out of her life as a father. Basically told her that I was dead, a dead junkie in the ditch, and that nobody would want her. They, one of the things, they refused to go on television the one time that they were going to do a news story on Alexis, and did a news story. Brenda Bowman, when the uh, news company or the news people called and said, you know, you want to plead for your daughter? You want to come on, on television and plead for her to come home? She goes, no, I'm still too devastated. Uh, she was really bothered about being adopted. Uh, what else did she say? Um, she was afraid that she was going to go to foster home because of fights with her parents. First of all, why would she go to a, to a foster home? You know, she's adopted. She's not an orphan that needs to go to a foster home. If anything, she would go to a youth center. Well, you know, in a private message, Brenda had said to me, the only time she's ever been in a foster home was when you put her in one. And then a week later, she's telling the news people that Alexis was afraid of going into a foster home because of fights with her mother. So I know that they tormented her about who I was and nobody loved her. And see, that's a whole lot of it, you know. It's not a positive thing to be adopted. It really isn't. See, when I found out, I started hearing things that just I couldn't believe. Children say there was one thing. Uh, kids who complain about being adopted, uh, what they heard growing up was, aren't you glad you weren't aborted? You, you could have just been an abortion. Why, you know, why would you say that to somebody? Because they were adopted. Because they're whining about a fever. You know, and, and having a negative uh, view of really against adoption really makes people question themselves, too, because everybody's so positive about adoption. You know, well, I would never hurt a child. Well, it's not about you, you know, it's about the kid. You know, adoption can be a bad, it can enslave children, it can make them disappear, it makes them disappear. They, they no longer have a connection to a family that. It's biological. Now, you know, if the Bowens were out here fighting, looking for Alexis as hard as I was, mm -hmm. or, or am, it, it would be, I'd have a different view, maybe. But well, you have to realize that not all adoptive parents are like the Bowens. Oh, well, I know that. I know that. But mm -hmm. I don't believe that children should be just given away, honestly. I think they should stay within their family, their biological family, if at all possible. You know, if it absolutely is the last resort, okay. But I think... A human being wants to know where they biologically come from, or they would not always go. These kids always seek their family, just about always. Didn't you? No, I didn't. No, I, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Okay, well, you're an exception. Most <laughs> people want to know who they biologically come from. I mean, you know, if nothing else, just to know, what, why have I got this tumor growing out the side of me, you know? Mm. There is the health history issue. You know, there are reasons that people, and I think a majority of them, do go looking for their parents. They need to know. I needed to know who my father was, but my mother never would tell me. You know, so it's just not, it wasn't fair of me to decide for Alexis who her parents were going to be. God gave her to me, you know. It wasn't fair of anybody to say, 
other people, strangers, could be a better parent to your kid than you. They should have sat with me and seen what kind of parent I was, and they never did. And I, you know, I was so young, I didn't even know my rights. Kathy, we're going to have to, uh, I think, end this uh, interview and conversation on that. I, um, where can people find you online? Website, Facebook, where can they find you? Uh, Facebook. Facebook, I have a page, uh, Find Andrea M. Bowman, um, and I'm usually there most of the time. There is a $25,000 reward for her. Okay. Uh, where if, you, if anybody has information for her whereabouts and can you know, produce a, her mm -hmm. uh, or information leading to the arrest of the person sure. responsible. Sure, sure. So that, I wanted to put that out there so everybody knows. Okay. And, um, you know, just... Come to the website, uh, pinned to the top of the page. What's the website? What story. is the website? Oh, well, there's not a website, actually. Oh. The only website I have for her is through the um, Michigan Search and Rescue. And oh, okay. At this point, I couldn't even tell you exactly how to do that. But there's a flyer on my uh, the page that I have her on Facebook that will tell you exactly where that website is. And it's, it's a website that you could print her flyers off of. Um, okay. It's not something I've set up. All right, Kathy. I appreciate this discussion. Thank you for being, uh, you know, so vocal about, you know, your, uh, you know, doing this. I hope that my listeners, uh, you know, can help you in this somehow. You know, my, you know, mainly my listeners in Michigan, maybe they know something that uh, that can be added to, you know, the information that you already have. Well, I'm always praying for that. I'm always praying for that. And I just want to say one other thing. I'm not doing it just for Alexis. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this for other children that went missing in, under circumstances like this. And there are several. There are. These are just the kids we know about. Yes, these are just the kids we know about. And something has to change. You know, these children that are adopted, they need to send further follow-up until they grow up, obviously. You know, you just don't know what's going to happen. You can't read a person's mind. Dennis Bowman adopted my daughter with a history of violence against women and was able to hide it because he did it as a teenager. So, Kathy, so. thank you for joining me on this episode of Unfound. Thank you. And that was my 2016 interview with Andrea Bowman's biological mother, Kathy Tarkanian. I thanked her then, and I will thank her now for appearing on the program. As all of you know, I side with my guests 99.9999% of the time on this program for obvious reasons, but on the topic of adoption, Kathy and I will have to continue to disagree. I'm adopted. It worked out for me, and it's worked out for millions of children. Are there some bad stories? Of course, but they are not even close to the majority. And that's all I really want to say about that. You can read more of my thoughts on the topic if you buy Season 1, Volume 2 of the Unfound book series. As I listened to the interview again, I realized that this probably wouldn't happen now in the 21st century. I think allegations of abuse by boys and girls is taken a lot more seriously in 2019, especially if a counselor, nurse, or someone like that discovers the boy or girl is adopted all sorts of red flags start going up, including did a family adopt this child for the expressed purpose of abuse? You probably noticed Kathy and I talked quite a bit about what she believed happened to Andrea. That is a question I asked back then. I don't ever ask guests that direct a question now. Why? Well, what I learned since then is, number one, that's a good way to get sued. I left it in for this interview because we now know Dennis Bowman is a convicted felon and it would be hard for him to claim defamation. But number two is actually a bigger point. I don't ask the what do you think happened question anymore because I don't want all of you to sway your opinions on what the guest says. This is why we don't do theories on Unfound. This is why we try to stick to the facts as much as we can. We want diversity of thoughts, feelings, and opinions on all cases unfound covers. And I think when the guest or myself is very upright with our beliefs, then many of you tailor your own thoughts accordingly. And I don't want that. So the what do you think happened question is no longer part of the interview process. This case, though, comes down to Dennis Bowman. 
As I noted before the interview, Kathy does reference a murder in 1980 that could have been connected to Dennis. Go back and note how she talks about a murder that was, quote unquote, right around the corner. It happened right before Dennis's knife attack that sent him to jail for most of the 1980s. Well, now we know Kathy was correct. Dennis Bowman is almost certainly a serial killer. I wouldn't be surprised if they eventually connect the murder right after he got out of jail to him as well. Yet the issue is still Andrea. Where is she? The best news to come out of Dennis being charged with murder is now investigators can go on to his property legally, looking for evidence of not just Kathleen's murder, but Andrea's disappearance. I believe Kathy is going to find out if her theory was true, that Dennis killed Andrea and buried her on his property. I can hope this group of police don't mess it up like the cops did the first time around in Zoe Campos's murder. Fingers crossed. I also have to ask, what role did Dennis's wife, Andrea's adoptive mother, play in all of this? She has to know what happened to Andrea, right? I wonder what she's been doing since Dennis was charged. Hopefully, she's being very honest with investigators. I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.